Can everybody hear me? Cool. I've never used a mic like this before. It's exciting. I feel like a radio announcer, as someone said, to talk like you're a radio announcer. Yeah. So, morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Max said, my name is Michelle Totolo. I am a software engineer at Square over in San Francisco. Uh, does everyone here know what Square is? OK, good. I'm not going to do a demo or pitch or I wasn't going to anyway. Anyway, um, as uh, you heard in my bio, I have quite a colored history. Um, so I first started out doing consulting, primarily in mobile, but also in sort of API development, specifically around mobile apps. I then went full mobile for a couple of years, and now I do back end. So over the course of my career, I've been dealing with APIs from both sides. I spent a long, long time primarily consuming them, and now as a backend engineer, I'm writing them. So the focus of this talk is what do API consumers care about? You hear a lot of talks that are like, build your APIs this way, build your APIs that way, but I specifically want to think about how someone using your APIs is going to evaluate it to give you some tools so that the next time you're building out an API, you can think like the person on the other side. So, and I'm going to totally spoil the talk right now and tell you exactly what they care about, and then we're going to go into details. So they care about documentation, what your URL structure is going to be like, what your payloads are like, authentication, authentication and authorization, they're different, error handling, and caching. And this is a very, very small subset of the things that people care about. There's obvious a lot, obviously a lot more. Um, but over the course of the talk, I'll be sharing some fun stories that have to deal with all of these areas, because I've seen some things. So let's get started. So documentation. Good. Documentation exists. That was a joke. <laughs> And it's true, I don't know how many times I tried integrating with someone's API and they'd like link me to the source code. That's useless, especially I started my career knowing PHP and then I went into Objective-C. If you were gonna send me into Ruby or Java, I would have absolutely no idea what was going on. So you need to have an artifact or something so that people can read along and then reference it as they're debugging, seeing weird things. Bonus is if it's interactive. The tooling around interactive documentation and generation has gotten really, really great. Some of you are probably thinking, I don't want to like write some web page to do this. There's tooling for it. Um, so if you're not familiar with the open API specification or any of the other tools available that let you document your APIs in a computer, computer readable format, I highly recommend you use it because then you get stuff like this for free. So this is a library that read, Redoc is a library that reads a, a open API specifications and will generate static HTML, CSS, JavaScript for you. And it takes all of the information, puts it on a web page, you can put it wherever the heck you want, and it has an interactive console, which is the most important part. Because the first thing I do as a consumer of API is try it out. And if I don't have to write any code to try out your API, it's gonna be a lot better. And then you can also do things like, if you're debugging, you can just send someone a payload and be like, try this in the documentation and tell me what happens. Instead of having to like walk over, open a console, run something locally, but then the other person needs to set it up locally, it's a huge pain. So having a place like this makes coordinating and communicating really, really great. The bad. Documentation that isn't up to date. This happens a lot. Um, so back in my consulting days, I would be working with companies who were building out the first version of their mobile app. And for a lot of those companies, this was also the first version of their API, because obviously mobile apps need APIs to work. So we would be iterating really fast, working really closely together, and then something would ship to production, but then we wouldn't update the documentation, so then it'd be kind of difficult to keep up or you'd say, oh, this was last updated two weeks ago, what's the latest version, has anything changed? And you'd have to go and talk to a person every single time. Again, slows things down, it interrupts developers who don't like being interrupted, and it's just not a great experience. So, the ugly. Documentation? Again, this goes back to people who think API documentation as code does not exist. 
um, or people who think they can just like write prose and tell you about their document, tell you about their API in prose-like format. That's not not great. I want code samples. I want payload examples. I want all of those really great things. So um, usually this is my reaction. You keep using that word documentation. I do not think it means what you think it means. Um, and again, happened to me. It's fun. So let's talk about URLs. Now I'm specifically calling out URLs here because as a consumer of APIs, I like writing code as few times as possible. So if I can write some helpers to automatically generate URLs for me, I'm going to, which is why they're so important. So good URLs have consistency. You would probably expect this. Uh, REST is a thing now. I don't necessarily have to explain REST anymore. I've given this talk quite a few times. I used to have to explain REST, now I don't. Um, so having things that are consistent, where you know what the different parts of the path mean, you know what the identifiers mean, just as someone with developer common sense, I can understand what these different URLs are doing. So if you're going to have a RESTful API, follow RESTful conventions. If you're having a different paradigm, if you're going with something like gRPC or GraphQL or any of that stuff, again, follow what their conventions have been established. The bad, inconsistency. I see this so often when working with APIs that were developed one-off for all of these different projects. And I'll talk about this a lot because when companies build their first version of their mobile app, they're usually starting to use some APIs that were built for JavaScript front ends. They're not necessarily the same. Um, those endpoints were built one-off in time by various different teams, so tend to be inconsistent. So you get things like, oh, these all look consistent. But then you get these weird things where the last ID in the path is not actually related to the object that came before it. Um, I've seen this done as an optimization for like, instead of having like four or five nested things, you can do this one super special thing and then it, you don't have a really long URL. It's really, really hard to debug. It's hard to understand. And you're going to forget about it, to be perfectly honest. So the ugly, send get to slash remove to delete something. I did this, <laughs> so it's not a joke. You're not following standard HTTP semantics and you're not following built-in caching semantics because a lot of client libraries make assumptions about gets versus deletes. So then you really just want to run away because this is really, really bad. Please don't do it. <laughs> uh, we had to debug a whole bunch of problems because of this and we eventually got them to change it. Turned out they had some weird firewall rules. They couldn't send deletes so they had to update their firewall in order to send a delete request because technology is hard. Okay, payloads. Good things about payloads. You have all of your data. Um, one of the biggest problems that I ran into when I was working in mobile is that you had to use sometimes four or five different endpoints to get all of the data for a single screen. And then as the client side developer, I have to be like, okay, I have five endpoints. What if one of them fails? Are any of them dependent on each other? And then you get into these weird states where like maybe I can get the really big product images, but I can't show the price on an e-commerce app. That's like a really bad experience. Um, so you wanna make sure that the APIs you're building have all of the information. And if you're starting to see requests come in like three or four at the same time, hopefully you have some good tooling around that, you might wanna think about combining those because I think we've gone past the days of like only ever write generic APIs. You also want to be able to write APIs that are custom for the experiences that you want to create. Your payload should also respect the content type. I'll get into a little bit about why later, but if you're ever sending something back that wasn't the same content type, it causes problems. And versioning. So in my experience, payloads are the things that should be versioned. Um, not necessarily, URLs are easy to change. Those are, you know, not a problem. But as soon as you make a breaking change, change to your payload, that's when you want a version. Because some clients consuming that, they're gonna go look for a field that doesn't exist. Maybe it's the price for a product and it's not going to be there. Um, or in the case of a mobile application, the app might crash. So versioning is not, is for payloads, not necessarily for other things. So the bad, okay, story time. Um, I've worked on a lot of e-commerce apps, like probably about five of them now, 
Um, and one of our clients, we were building out the first version of their app. They had a JavaScript front end single page app. This was back in like 2014. I don't remember what framework they're using, but I'm pretty sure it's dead now. And so they built out some new endpoints for the app, but in a lot of instances, we were reusing endpoints that had been built for this JavaScript front end. So for instance, there were a bunch of different ways to get product information. You could get a list of products, you could get individual details of products, and you can also see some product information in the cart. Now what happened is because these APIs were developed mostly organically over time, is we had a hard time figuring out what the product ID was. And, in, and this is an abbreviated list, there are actually seven of these, and some of them actually returned the product ID in two different fields. And I had to write code to handle this because we were doing you know, good object-oriented programming. We don't want to pass around just random like hashes or dictionaries. We wanted an object, so you had to write a parser. It was a pain. And this was actually in a whiteboard in the conference room we were working in because no one could keep it straight. It was not great. So be consistent. And even when you're creating those single one-off APIs, you do want to start establishing conventions for things. Do you want to use the ID field? What happens if you have nested products, like in the cart, where you have a cart item with like quantity and like a SKU number maybe, but then you actually have like a subset of product details with like a little picture and the name? Um, you need to figure that stuff out early. Otherwise, you're going to write code that deals with this, and it's really not great code. The other thing about payloads is dealing with change. So as I, I said, I worked a lot with teams who were building out APIs basically as fast as we could use them. And so things were changing left and right. So we expect certain things. If you're looking through a piece of documentation, even if it's just really basic, you're going to make assumptions about what you see, like image URLs having HTTP in them. Um, this actually became a problem for us because uh, way back when, SSL was not as ubiquitous on the web, so the team was working to add SSL to the full website, and they decided to take out HTTP colon slash slash from all of the image URLs they passed back through the API, so that depending on whether you want HTTPS or not, you could use the right uh, beginning. But they didn't tell us, and we had a board demo that morning. So we're, our, I was not in the room, thankfully. I heard about this later because I had to debug it. But they were doing board demo, and all of a sudden, things were looking great, things were looking great. They get to one specific page, because they'd only done this to one API, which was the product details page, and they couldn't load any pictures in front of the board. It was really bad. It made us look bad. It made everyone else look bad. So even by having some really simple assumptions, you want to make sure that those don't change. Another thing that happened, a uh, different company, they were expanding into different AWS regions, and so their different machines didn't have time zones. They were now in different time zones. They wanted to add time zones to all the dates. Guess what you hard code in most client-side applications? Date parsing. You can't get that from a server usually. So again, it caused a crasher. They had to roll it back. And then we had to figure out what was the time, the one and only true timestamp form, format we were going to use for everything. Because trust me, you do not want to deal with four, five, six different ways of parsing timestamps depending on what endpoint you're using. Again, it's really not fun code to write, it's not fun code to maintain, and it leads to a lot of bugs. So as consumers of APIs, when it comes to payloads, we expect certain things to not change. So when you're writing your documentation, if you have an example uh, date, if you have an example URL, people are going to assume that that's what it's going to be unless you say otherwise. The ugly, this is where we get into some fun stuff. JSON containing HTML. This was actually a bug way back when in like Rails 2 or 3, where if you requested JSON and it had some sort of internal server error, it would return an HTML page. Um, sometimes it's JSON, sometimes it's not. It was, it was a massive pain. And as a client-side application, our JSON parsing would fail. Sometimes we would crash if we weren't handling the error. And sometimes it would just have a blank screen, which is obviously a really bad experience. Uh, I also asked on Twitter a couple years ago. So this one is, how about an XML response containing one element in which there lurks the real XML document as an escaped string? 
I've also seen this done with JSON, though. Um, also, again, for those uh, JavaScript front ends, because I know there's some interesting semantics around error handling with the HTTP status codes. Again, really, really not fun to deal with. Um, I mostly think that people do this, they want to do it really fast, but then as a consuming developer, I'm like, you're just trolling me. And again, going back to the stability of your APIs. There's nothing more frustrating than dealing with an unstable API because you can have everything working beautifully one day, and then the next day you come in and everything's going wrong and you have no idea what just happened. So you're like, my code didn't change. Um, and it wastes developer cycles, it needs more communication, more overhead, and generally it's just a worse experience for everyone. Okay, authentication. Good. SSL. If you're not using SSL, please use SSL. The first few times I gave this talk, SSL wasn't as easy to get. You still had to pay those like ridiculously priced certificates. But now you can do it for free. So please use it. Um, but make sure it's secure. <laughs> um, security is a really big thing when it comes to authentication and authorization. And have your bases covered. Who remembers go to fail? Oh, only a couple of hands. So this was a bug in, uh, on iOS and Mac a couple of years ago where in certain conditions, it would actually bypass SSL certificate verification on the client side. So that means anyone could have man in the middle all of your stuff and it would have been totally fine, um, which is why you have to care not just about where your code lives and where your servers are and what your firewalls are doing, or what browser or what iOS or uh, mobile version that the person on the other end is using, you have to worry about everything in between. Uh, which is why SSL pinning, if, you have, uh, if you're working with mobile clients, use SSL pinning. It's just two-way, make sure that both are, agree that they are who they say they are instead of just a one-way. Um, it really, really helps the security and it's a lot easier to do now than it was a couple years ago. Um, and then, of course, use an open standard, something like OAuth, to actually authenticate your users. So authentication is, in some ways, about if you're dealing with mobile, you have to identify the mobile client. If you're in a browser, you just authenticate the user and hope that the browser is OK. Well, not hope, but try to do a little better. The bad, also OAuth. <laughs> um, again, lovely friend from Twitter. Can you have a slide that says OAuth and leave it up there for 45 minutes? <laughs> OAuth is very controversial, <laughs> um, but it is an open standard, and you want to use standards because when we get to the ugly, you can become Bob the Builder and then build everything yourself. And then guess what? There's no tutorials on how this works. You can't look things up on Stack Overflow. There's no videos. There's no conference talks. It's completely homegrown, which means your developers are going to hard, you know, they might build it once, but then if they need to support it ongoing, it's just going to be a pain. And you're also going to expose yourself to vulnerabilities that the community would have fixed. Um, one of my coworkers in InfoSec puts it as, you are a zebra, and everyone else in the Serengeti is a lion, if you rely too much on your own code. So authorization, which I'm going to say is different than authentication. Authentication is who are you. Authorization is what are you allowed to do. And there's a very important reason why you separate these two. Uh, so for good auth authorization, you want whatever your client-side application is to request permissions to do things. You want to be very explicit in what it can do, especially because chances are when you're building out your APIs, you're like, oh, get post, put, post, delete, done, right? You have all of them. They're just available. But sometimes you don't want people deleting. Uh, I actually really love the Google Cloud APIs because they have explicit OAuth scopes for literally doing everything. And by using this, what you can do is say you have an admin level credential. If you authenticate and say this instance of this credential is only allowed to read, if someone gets a hold of that credential, that, that token, they're not going to be able to write. They're not going to be able to delete. So it significantly reduces the attack vector in case you're compromised in some way. So the bad, a single API key. Yeah, this is super, super popular, and I'm really glad to see that some of the major API providers are moving away from it. And you're probably wondering, everybody does this. Why is it so bad? 
Uh, well, first of all, that API key is compromised. Guess what? You need to change it. There is a day for mobile on Apple's store where it took 10 days to get a new version out. Can you imagine your users waiting 10 days to use your application? No, they're just going to delete it unless you're like, you know, super important like their financial app or messages or something. But for most of us, it's like end of life for the product if that happens. But you also have to deal with things that can get a little hairy. Like you could end up rate limiting yourselves. This also happened to me in production. Um, app got featured on Apple's homepage, tons of downloads, and we exceeded ourselves at rate limit. And it took at least an hour for the app to recover, all because we were using a single API key instead of having a more robust solution to handle this. I also, when I was researching the Redoc example, they used Giphy's API, and the API key there is also like permanently rate limited from Giphy, which I thought was hilarious. Um, so you can do all sorts of crazy things with API keys. The ugly, authorization. If you're only doing authentication and you're giving users full read-write access to everything, things are going to eventually go wrong. I've worked at companies where third parties reverse engineered our APIs from the mobile apps because they weren't public and then just started using them. You don't want that to happen to you. You don't want some malicious, not necessarily malicious, but just curious even third parties using what you built without your permission, especially because you're going to have to pay for the server costs. You're going to have to pay for all of the in increased traffic. You're going to have to deal with what happens when they accidentally you know, DDoS your server, but it's an API that only the app uses, so how could that happen? A lot of people also don't think about authorization when it comes to mobile because they think it's super secure. You can totally trust Apple and Google to have the most secure things ever. But there are proxies. There are people who set up bogus Wi-Fi networks. Um, Charles is de a debugging proxy that we've frequently used in mobile because you just wanted to see what was happening, especially if you're dealing with like a third party SDK. You want to see what was happening. Um, it's also like you can Google it and there's a whole bunch of information out there how to do it. Um, so you can't always assume that just because you're using a vendor for something or a provider that has a low level framework that it's going to be secure and just keep track of everything for you. You still need to care. Errors. Everybody loves the unhappy path. So good. Using proper HTTP error status codes. They're great. People can make assumptions about them that they don't have to revisit and recode and write all these exceptions for. Um, a really great thing is to have an error message and a response for a developer so they know exactly what went wrong instead of them having to guess. Um, the worst thing to do is to have like a blob of JSON that you sent and then the example blob of JSON, and then you're just going key by key and figuring out which key is incorrect. Um, again, I've done it. And once you get JSON blobs that are like, you know, 70, 100 keys in them, which you can, it's, it's painful. But you also want a human readable error message because at some point, if this is important enough, it's gonna be affecting the user's experience. So you wanna make sure that they're having the best experience possible say, oh, hey, we can't load this right now. And why is that, Michelle? And that's because you don't want to have a single generic error message that just pops up all the time. It's true. I had an app that did this. They made the decision. Every time we get an error, just show an alert. Oops, something's amiss. You'd be like scrolling through lists, and like randomly this alert would pop up, and you're like, but what's wrong? Everything on the page looks fine. Did I do something wrong? What, what should I do? it becomes incredibly confusing. Um, so don't have super generic error messages. Um, you also don't want APIs that return a 200, but then have an error in the body. I know that, that there are some JavaScript web frameworks that have you know, some semantics around this, but if you're not dealing with that, if it's not required, make sure you're using your proper status codes because as a consumer of your APIs, if I get a 200, I think everything's great. I think everything's actually okay, and I don't have to like dig in and find some random error thing that you threw in there. And let's get to the ugly. 
As I mentioned, APIs can return HTML pages on error instead of JSON. Gotta love sending HTML to JSON parsers. That works great. Uh, 404 pages that return 200 in HTML instead of JSON. Again, respecting content type, respecting HTTP status codes, because these are really simple things that can make the consumers of your API have a much better experience in integrating with your API. When you don't, it kind of goes a little bit off. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little weird. So, caching. What is good to cache? Well, we have standards. Um, there are several standards and several different ways to do caching. And why is caching important? Well, your app might be on the front page of Apple's App Store one day, and you go from having a couple hundred users to thousands in the span of a couple hours. You want that stuff to be cached. So you can, do, you can use the cache control header, which lets you set all sorts of information, how long something should be cached, uh, what is the max age that something could, be ha could have, or you could say don't cache, uh, which you're going to want to do on some of your endpoints. Um, you can you send an if modified since header and say, hey, only give me new information if it hasn't been modified since yesterday. And then HTTP, most of the good clients out there, will return a specific uh, status code so you can handle that separately from the rest of your cases if you want to. You can also use e-tags. E-tags are these little tokens that you can save and then send back and saying, only give me new information if this new information is available after this tag. It's just a token-based way of doing the same thing. So the bad, manually processing your data every single time. Um, you shouldn't necessarily be going to a database to return information that hasn't changed. Caches are really great. The caching technology has evolved in so many amazing ways. And it is cheaper and easier than ever to just add a caching layer in front of it. You will need to tune it, um, but manually processing every time also means your APIs are faster. So everyone gets a better experience. Your servers have less load, and your end users get to see their information a lot quicker. The ugly. Caching. I don't care. Again, I've, I've heard this. They're like, oh, our servers can handle it just fine. And I'm like, but some of your requests take one or two seconds. No one wants to deal with that. And that's like me being on good office Wi-Fi, not driving through the middle of nowhere, going from cell tower to cell tower, and like my service constantly dropping, which we always talk about in mobile, the tunnel problem, which is what happens when a user is using your app, not while driving, but as a passenger. And yes, that's a very important distinction to make when I give this example now. <laughs> So someone's using the app in a car, goes into a tunnel, and then you have no service. But like the app was doing things. How do you handle that? Caching helps with that, and you need to, so if you have locally available data that you, know, you can use, your device will cache it locally if you set one of those headers. And if you don't do caching, it just causes lots of headaches. Um, but you do need to do caching correctly. You don't want to be serving old data. You, you know, I've seen some really interesting bugs on servers where one of the caches was configured incorrectly. So it's not the easiest thing, but definitely think about it. So to sum up everything we've talked about, when people are consuming your APIs, they want consistency. They want to be able to quickly scan over your documentation. They want to understand the patterns that you're using and that you've established. They want to understand what are the conventions that you've established and to see if you're using established conventions from the rest of the development. So conventions. And you also want to keep your APIs simple. You don't want people guessing. You don't want people second guessing. You don't want people having to bug another member of a team every time they have a question because, oh, hey, this is a little weird. I don't quite understand it. So by keeping your APIs as simple as possible and tailored when you can, uh, you'll have a much better experience with consumers of your APIs. And that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>
Yes, I have. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I had to. I have had to do this before, and we started by trying to use a standard first of all, simply because if you don't have anything to start from other than what already exists, if you can build to OpenAPI Spec or RAML or any of the other. Um, those are the two most popular standards now, but any of the ones, you'll get a whole bunch of tooling for free. Um, but then it's honestly really just exercising the API. It's going through um, seeing what examples you can find. Um, if you have source code that uses that API, that is a really great place to start because then you can start seeing all of the little nuances like, oh, are they sending this number as a string sometimes in, in some ways or sending it as a number in the other? I've worked a lot with e-commerce and financial applications, and so we always work in cents instead of in dollars because floating point math is horrible. Um, so like little, you'll start to learn little things like that as well as start figuring out those inconsistencies. Um, that table I showed with the different product endpoints, all of those endpoints that already existed didn't have documentation. So we were going through and documenting them as we went along simply because like we needed to use them other teams needed to use them, um, and the ownership of APIs will change as your organization grows too. So um, those would kind of be my recommendations. It is a lot of like trial and error. <laughs> um, if you haven't used a tool like Postman, it lets you make API calls locally on your machine. Um, there's other. There's also Paw for Mac, which does the same thing. So it's just like a basically an HTTP client as a GUI. Um, so you can just plug in and play around with things there. Um, that works really well too. You briefly touched on um, versioning API endpoints, but in your opinion or, or based on what you've seen, um, what, it seems like there are a lot of different ways to handle versioning, uh, ranging from host names to paths to headers to a payload. Mm -hmm. what, what seems to be the best practice or what do you prefer? I'm a big fan of path versioning simply because Every time I'm like as a backend developer looking at my logs, you'll have the path name printed. As a client developer looking at my logs, you'll have the path name printed. It's kind of like if you're going to only log one or two things about a request, it's going to include the path name. Um, sometimes you might have headers. Um, at Square, we're a financial company, so we actually have redactions in a lot of our logs, and they cover a 10 digit numbers, for instance. <laughs> so sometimes it gets a little hairy if you are trying to like rely on payloads because that's gonna be a little bit heavier redaction. Um, I've also seen what works well is um, date versioning as well, So, but that's a lot more work to support. So if you ever wanna make a change, you're like, I want the API as of June 1st, 2018, um, then you as the developer need to own that. Um, so I, I do suggest paths. Um, we can debate later if anyone has other uh, opinions. Okay. Yeah, I have a question about payloads. Can, I don't know where you are. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, got a question about payloads. So when you have a key basically jump around the payload, how, what are your best practices for tracking down that key? Does it move from your most recent call or oh. how do you handle the changes? Um, I'll, I spent six months at my last job building a tool that did this. They didn't open source it, unfortunately, before I left. Um, it's kind of difficult. Um, so the, like, the, if you're dealing with those kinds of issues between changes or between like deploys, for instance, like you're working with a, an API team, the API team is moving really, really fast, they're moving stuff around. Um, the best thing you can do, and um, I've also, done this is have like a, a Jenkins job or something that hits the API and just validates the format. Like if you can't tie it to their deploy fine, but just have it hit it like every four hours in like a staging environment or something just so you can kind of get notified of those changes beforehand. So you can come in, you know, Monday morning and see that, oh, someone deployed late Friday night and my little test says that the format's changed. Um, and you don't need to use any of the formats for that. If you do use um, OpenAPI Spec or uh, RAML, you can do validation against the documentation, but you can also just write it yourself. If it's like business critical, um, just be like, I expect the structure to look like this, and then 
just kind of run it, but it is kind of a manual process up until you have a more, up until your API team has a more robust test infrastructure that will find those changes ahead of time, uh, but also work with them on actually establishing a contract. It's natural for APIs to evolve over the course of development, but you wanna really start nailing down that contract as soon as you have a really good idea of what it's going to be. Otherwise, you're just gonna keep doing this, and then once it gets into the wild, it's gonna break things. Mm. Robust API test framework. Um, so I've experimented a little bit with PACT, um, P-A-C-T. It is a two-way test framework, so it involves both the client and the producer of the APIs, and that they both basically agree on a contract, um, and as part of your integration tests, they both run. Um, it's a little complicated to set up, but um, I've seen it running and it does help with that like tracking changes problem. Um, so that's kind of the only one I've used other than just like kind of doing it myself with manual. Yeah, a lot of that comes down to um, the user experience. So um, one of the e-commerce apps I worked on had a separate endpoint for product details and reviews. Um, you could get like the star rating from the product details call, but otherwise if you wanted like any reviews that was a separate endpoint. And so it would be a really weird experience. And we ended up moving this into one API because what would start to happen is the reviews was a new service, so it wasn't as robust. It, the API was not as tuned. So we'd see all the product details and then like a list of start, like four out of five, and then no reviews. And so it was just a really poor experience. Um, or when you're dealing with people in really poor network conditions, if you have to make a couple different calls, some of those are going to fail, and then you'll have to start dealing with a very inconsistent state that you're showing to your end customer which again is not necessarily great, especially like with, I worked a lot in e-commerce, like you wanna make sure you're seeing like the product and like the price and like a button that says add to cart and when it adds to cart, it works. Um, so it's more experience driven rather than performance driven, but with HTTP2, so who here knows about some of the differences between HTTP 1.1 and 2? Not, okay, a couple. So one of the big things about HTTP2 is its ability to what they call multiplex. So right now with an HTTP connection, you kind of can make one request at a time per connection. It establishes a single connection. But with HTTP2, it interlaces things. So it has more concurrency enabled and you can do more things with it. Um, it's just generally a better design. So you can send more data over HTTP2, but again, you also have to worry about those connection resets and like if a request is partially respond, like if you've gotten part of it back, it just makes things a little bit more complicated. So if you're not looking into HTTP2, I do suggest doing it. It looks to be a really cool performance boost. It's not necessarily supported anywhere, especially older Android versions and um, some of the older browsers. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I'm heavily skewed. I used to do some work with the open API spec, which is probably why I've talked about it so much. I think their tools are just great. So I think we'll see a lot more tooling around doing a lot of the kind of API toil. Um, so toil is a, a word in the uh, SRE or site reliability engineer world, which is like really boring automated, automatable tasks that aren't. So like writing a handler for you know a 404 error, like you're, you should be able to write that like maybe once and then you know reuse it. So I think we'll see a shift of more 
um, like auto, being able to auto-generate server and client code. It exists today. It's not really, really robust. Um, but I also think we'll see more people going the interactive API route. And um, one thing that I've seen that I really, really like is the ability to download. Um, so I mentioned Postman earlier. It's a Google Chrome app slash extension thingy. I don't know what they're calling them these days. Um, I've seen companies give you one of those so that it's not just a web page excuse me, with documentation, you can then load it into your interactive HTTP GUI and actually play around with it. So I think the Twilio stuff is really cool, really neat, but I think at the end of the day, focusing more on normal developer tools rather than the cool, like it's cool, let's, let's be honest, it's cool, but I think we'll see more focus on the like more standard developer tools simply because it's our bread and butter, it's what we know best, we like, you know, GUIs for certain things. We like command lines for certain things. Um, it's a good information, but it's not net, like, if you're debugging your Twilio API integration, are you gonna go play a game or are you gonna look at the documentation? You're gonna look at the documentation. Oh, there's a question all the way in the back. Oh, there's a mic. Oh, for server to server. Um, so like basically within your own internal networks? Yeah, or like if, if you know, that you already have authentication um, on your site and you just need to grab data from another site or something like that. Yeah, that can work. You still have to worry about if you have an API key and you're talking to a third party, you still have to worry about what happens when that API key gets taken um, because for, especially if you're working with like a public third party API, there's gonna be some other sort of public infrastructure between your stuff and their stuff. Um, it's okay, like I know it's, it's the standard and a lot of people do it and we're not getting rid of it anytime soon, um, but it does have some inherent risks. Now if you're within your own um, world um, and you're using API keys, that can work. I've also seen SSL pinning work um, or if you wanna go really, really cool and advanced, you can add something like a service mesh that handles a lot of that for you. Um, at Square, we transitioned to Envoy uh, last year, and it's been really great for enforcing access controls, um, as well as it has a whole bunch of other stuff, but it is a much more advanced piece of infrastructure than you know, an API key. Okay, thanks. You're giving him a workout. <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask this. Um, so uh, at Square, we use something called Sake. It's open source, but you, it's very much our own thing. Uh, we built it before gRPC existed, which is, it's very similar to gRPC. So um, I'm biased there because I do like protobufs. I think they're, um, they're typed, which is amazing because JSON's not typed and it's, oh my gosh, it's caused me so much pain in the past because it was like, is this number being returned as a number or a string? Like, it happens all the time. Or is this true or in false, actual true or false, or in the string true and false? Um, so I'm a big fan of anything that lets you be much more explicit. Um, so, but REST is obviously a great choice. It's super versatile, it's super easy. Um, you do have a little bit more developer complication when it comes to something like gRPC. And then I'd say GraphQL is even more complicated. Um, so one of my coworkers, uh, Shawnee Gao, gave a talk at Ruby Kagi about some of the graph, kind of about the GraphQL stuff we're looking at doing. And GraphQL is great if you have a monolithic database. GraphQL is great if you have a very small amount of services. But if you're trying to get data from, let's say, hundreds of services and you want to do that over GraphQL, it becomes incredibly complicated. So. I think I'm waiting to see what the tooling looks like for GraphQL. As a consumer of the APIs, I think it's fantastic. I can completely configure my payload to give me exactly what I want. But there's a very large setup cost if you're not starting with it. 